God will make a way. He will never leave us or forsake us. And we just claim that promise. So as we sing this morning, lift those voices up. And it's beautiful to hear you all singing with us. God will make a way. to join me by standing as we sing our opening song softly and tenderly Oh, 
His wonderful love He has promised. Promise for you and for me. Though we have sinned, He has mercy and pardon. Father, we are so glad to be here in your house today to worship with you. Please come and draw near. Hear our praises, Lord. Know that our hearts are filled with joy to be your people. Thank you for loving us. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Welcome. I'm so glad to see all of you here. It's going to be a high day. It's a Sabbath, yes? Um, we are here to sing some praises, to give to the Lord our, our tithes and offerings, and to grow in his word as the pastor brings us the next in the series of putting on the armor of God. So put on your seatbelts. We're going to have a great day together, okay? Um, we have a few announcements that we need to, to make to draw your attention to, and I think Larry is up. He's ready. Huh? Oh, I'm wired. <laughs> he told us he was ready. I'm ready. How many of you have ever wished that you could say, Lord, send me a text or an email. I don't care if it's facts, but I need an answer. Can you help me? Anybody have that cross their mind beside me? Oh, a few of you. Oh, oh, well, I'm right at home. <clears throat> we want a forklift, right? And you folks have started giving money. I, ha I have to tell you, we, we had one, one fellow came to me and said, there's a check for $2,500 going in. Amen. Another for 1000 <clears throat> And I don't know, and I don't want to know how much is coming in in dollars, $5, $10. Some of you don't have much income. And I, I understand that. I don't know how you live on $867 a month Social Security, I just don't know how you do it. But I do know that the Lord blesses us all. We are truly blessed. And that's our children's story today. So, this is the story. I have an unofficial team around me <laughs> in community service and in this church, and I, I say, help. So we started finding forklifts. Mike, the mechanic, he found three this week at um, Richie Brothers. He went and tested them all. He says, these three are pretty good. The middle one is probably the best. So we geared up. <laughs> you geared up. <laughs> to make a bid on this forklift. Runs good, looks kind of cement stuck to it here and there. And then I got a call that a couple months ago I had requested some money from IEHP for community service. And they said, we think you're going, you have to apply, but we think you can get the money. And so 
this made me kind of feel, you know, weird. Because maybe I've got more money than I think. You know what I mean? Maybe the Lord's blessing us here at the church, and IEHP is going to throw a few bucks in, and, and maybe this less than perfect forklift is what we need. Although, if we can buy it for a couple thousand dollars and get by with it, we can always sell it for that much. You know what I mean? We, we don't, we're not out too much. And so we started watching that, and I said, well, don't pull the trigger on it, but let's look, and three or four of us discussed, and then David, I, and I'm using people's real names here because I want you to know that everybody's working on it. And David says, well, I found one. Do we have a picture of it? Huh, look at that one. It's been panned, it's been cleaned, it's got the big tires, and the other one didn't have the big tires. This is an outdoors one. The other one was like, see that one over there all beat up, how it's got little tiny tires? Those disappear in those cracks out there in our parking lot. <laughs> so, about the same time, the one at Ritchie Brothers hit $6,700. So Laura called up and says, it's $6,700. I said, don't buy it. Don't buy it. Maybe God's got something better for us. And then David sent me this for $7,000. It's all painted. It's been gone through. If, if we looked at the engine, it's all been cleaned and probably fixed up. I says, well, call and see if it's available. So he did. So about 5 o'clock, a few minutes before that, I called, text David, and I said, did you get an answer? He says, no. So I got no end of the story. <laughs> no end of the story. Monday morning, the story starts again. And you all keep praying, because I don't know which. Is it this one? Didn't get a text from God, but I'm praying about it. Is it this one? For $7,000? I don't know. Monday, I might. But you know, I think God does this to to build our faith that he's in control. And by the way, the other one that had cement all over it and the little wheels, it went for $12,000. So, God bless you as you walk through life with the rest of us. <laughs> because sometimes we just don't know what God's got in store for us. But he's got a plan, Larry. Yep. He's got a he plan. Does. Okay, Laura? Good morning. Happy Sabbath. I want to let you know that the first Sabbath in August, August 6th, we are going to have a special treat. And so I'm hoping that all of you can be here. We're going to have a guest speaker, Pastor Jerry Lopez from North American Division, who is the Assistant Director of Children's Ministries. He's coming all the way to come to our church to share and visit with us. So I'm hoping that all of you can plan to attend. Um, he's going to be, his, his message on Sabbath is going to be impress them in your children. And how many of you are concerned with the children of your church, the children in your families, that you care and you want, that's right, you care and you want them to know God and to walk with God and to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that the Lord loves them. So I hope that you will come and listen because even if you don't have small children at home, you have a lot of children in this church and you all can make a difference to those children. 
Following that church service, we will have a um, Mexican-style potluck. Um, and we are also, just so you know, reaching out to all the surrounding churches, so it won't be just us. It won't be just our church. We're inviting other local churches to come and enjoy. Because in the afternoon at 3 o'clock, then he's going to go through three different topics. And those topics are parenting with the media challenge. That's a good one. Making family worship fun. I don't know if you all were here, but I was talking about how sometimes we need to really get back to the basics and have family worship together. Spend that time because it will draw us all closer together. And also fostering family unity. Those are all some pretty big topics that I think can make a huge difference in each one of our homes and each one of our lives. So I hope that you do plan to attend. I know Pastor Jerry and he is a lot of fun. He's a really good man and a good person and it won't be dull and boring. And I think we can all get some tips and some ideas on how to get back to those basics and how to walk with God each and every day. So I hope to see you here August 6th. And please invite anyone that you know, a friend, a neighbor, another church member, let the other church know. Um, the more the merrier. He's, he's already shipped everything out. I've received box after box after box of materials and supplies. And so it's going to be a good program. Thank you. Happy Sabbath Church family. So great to be in the house of the Lord, amen. Just wanted to do a first reading of the names selected and has been um, received by the individuals with a resounding yes. And I wanna thank the organizing committee for coming together to prayerfully and carefully select these names. And so for the first reading, the names are Nancy Chadwick, Ben Cook, Daniel Marin, Christina Neff, Amy Nyberg, Mike Kilarte, Brian Serraru, and then for two alternates, Janelle Cook and Ezekiel uh, Alivei. Is that right? And so uh, this is our first reading, and next week we will be doing the second reading and we'll vote these names in. If you have any questions in regards to these names, and also how we have come together as organizing committee, uh, please feel free to come to us or any of the organizing committee members as well. Thank you very much. We look forward to uh, a great new year once all these new officers get elected. Um, we need to go ahead and wrap this up, but notice on the back of your bulletin there are announcements like game night next Saturday. Take a look at that, please. There's gonna be uh, potluck and family worship there and you have your Wednesday night prayers prayer meeting and everything so please take a look at that and make note so you don't miss out on something you would have loved to have done okay may God bless our worship as we continue today happy Sabbath and the word of God says, God, who made the world and everything in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he worshiped with men's hands as though he needs anything, since he gives to all life, breath, and all things. And inspiration says in, uh, Patriarchs and Prophets 525, the system of tithes and offerings was intended to impress the minds of men with the great truth that God is the source of every blessing to his creatures and that to him man's gratitude is due for the good gifts of his providence. May I ask the uh, deacons to please stand and also all the children, please stand. You're gonna collect the lamb's offering. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your blessings that you always pour upon us. 
be it the ones that we see and even the ones that we don't see, Father, but that we realize later. Father, forgive us the times that we have come short, but bless everyone who's going to give, Father, and especially bless those who will not be able to, that they may be able to give later. Thank you, Father, for everyone that's here. Uh, bless them and their families and the ones who could not attend, may you bless them as well. May you multiply these uh, tithes and offerings, which is to spread your word in all the world, and then you will come and take us home. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We collect all the dollars? Nope, nope, nope. There's two more. Any over here? Nope, we're gonna get them all. Hey, you guys did pretty good in that big one. Yeah, that was good. Okay, come on kids, sit up right here in front. <clears throat> yeah, get all that money in there. <laughs> That's a lot of work, isn't it? Okay, come on up here in front. Hi kids, how are you this morning? Hey, you wanna come over here, you'll, you, you'll see better over here. Don't get too far away. In my Bible, in this translation, the New Living Translation, it, this Psalm 23, it says, my cup runneth over. 
And we all read that and everything. But in my translation, it says, my cup overflows with blessings. Now, how are we going to understand my cup overflows with blessings? There's a cup. Isn't that a cute cup? You like that one? I like that one. But if, the, if that was full, it still wouldn't be very much. Hmm. What if it was this size? Now to make this sort of understandable, how many of you like Skittles or jelly beans? Yeah? So would you rather have this one or this one full of jelly beans? Yes! You want that one full of jelly beans. And you want it overflowing, right? Hmm. How many want this one? Hmm. But. Hmm. What if I had this cup? Hmm? Now, would you rather have this one full of Skittles and jelly beans, or this one, or this one? Yes! You want that big one? Yes! No question about it. But. Hmm. Now my cup runneth over, the psalmist says. If it was full of chocolate or jelly beans or Skittles, would you rather have this one or this one? This one or this one? Yes! Yes! I want the big one full of jelly beans. My cup runneth over with blessings. You see, when we deal with God, he makes bigger and better. They had lunch, and they started with a couple fishes, some little biscuits the little boy brought up. And Jesus started blessing it and breaking it, and they fed 10,000 people easily and they had food left over. My cup runneth over when Jesus puts his blessings on it. But, the story is told about three people. One got ten talents, one got five, got one, got one. And the lazy one went out and buried his and sat in the park and waited for him to come back. And the rest of them worked hard. And when the master came back, he said, you're a lazy person. He said, I know you, but you always want all the money you can get out of it. But he said, you're too lazy. So he took that away and gave it to the ten talent person because he worked hard and his cup runneth over. What if you're a ten talent person? What if God has given you lots of talents? And what if that was your cup? Which one would you like? This one? This one? This one, or the big one, or would you like this one? Yeah, all right. <clears throat> and you know, is there any Malachi's here? There's, that's a name from the, from the Bible. No Malachi's? There's a thing in the Bible that says, if you pay your tithe and you're close to God, if you're a real friend of God, He's going to pour out blessings from heaven. Now, wouldn't you like my cup runneth over to fill that with blessings for you? 
Maybe Skittles, a few Skittles, huh? So would you like this one? Yes! All right, that one's yours. But that's not good enough for me. No, sir. My God's a big God. And when I do my part and pay my tithe and give my offerings and I love God, I can be a ten-talent person. And he will bless you. And the best thing about it is when my cup runneth over, there's a lot more runneth over than that little cup. Do you see that? It wouldn't take much to overflow that pitiful little cup. But man, when this thing overflows, then it makes a big deal, right? Twelve baskets of food left over when Jesus fed that 5,000. Twelve baskets, that's enough to feed this whole bunch here. Left over. Wow, what a blessing. Oh. How are you going to remember this? You want that cup or you want to share mine? Ah, mine and my cup runneth over because I have something for each of you in my bucket. My cup runneth over. Go ahead, take one. You get first choice. My cup runneth over. Hurry up, take one. Come on, hurry up, take one. There you go. You got one? You got to grab it fast here. Okay. No Skittles here today. Sorry about that. Are there jelly beans? No, no jelly beans. Molly called too late for me to do that from Canada. Jeez, you can't even say no to Molly from Canada. Did you know that? You can't. Okay. Everybody got, got some crackers? Huh? There you go. All right. Here you go. You want one? Okay, take one. All right. So just, just remember, oh, here's a hand up. Yeah, my bucket. My cup runneth over. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, just remember now, when you do your part, God will do his part, and your cup will run over. All right, you can go back and sit down. <laughs> Sabbath. Let's, if you are able, please join us in praying and kneeling for prayer. Dear God, thank you for the Sabbath. Thank you for loving us, for being our friend. How us to know you are. And to be like you, please bless the pastor and speak to him that we may know you more. In Jesus' name, amen. I love you, Lord. You give me strength. The Lord is my rock and I and my place of safety. He is 
the God who saves me. My God is my rock. I go to him for safety. He is like a shield to me. He's the power that saves me. He's my place of safety. I called out to the Lord. He is worthy of praise. He saved me from my enemies. Amen. Amen. Join with us as, uh, and stand with us as we sing, Tis So Sweet to Trust in Jesus. Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus, just to take Him at His word, just to rest upon His promise, just to know. Save the Lord. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust Him. How I prove it him and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. Yes, it's sweet to trust in Jesus, just from sin and self. Jesus simply taking life and rest and joy and peace. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, how I prove him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus. Savior friend, 
Amen and amen. What a mighty God we serve. And what a blessing for us to be able to trust in him always, every moment of our lives. Ladies and gentlemen and brothers and sisters, God is on the move here at Hemet Seventh Avenue Church. Amen. amen. Every single Sabbath we come to church, we witness God's presence in each and every one of us. It is one of those God moments that Nancy talked about during the course of the Vacation Bible School. And here at Hemet Seventh Avenue Church, we are serious when the Word of God says to teach our children the way he or she should go. Even this morning, we saw a beautiful, just a wonderful scenery of, of parents coming together and praying with their child, reading scripture with their daughter. And this is what our church is all about. If there's one of the core values that we can definitely highlight here at Hemet Seventh Avenue Church, it is just that that we are serious about raising our children in the way that they should go. I thank the Lord for what we were able to experience here at our church last week, well actually the week before, all throughout the course of the week as each individual who took part in it came together to prepare this place from the sanctuary to the outer courts of our church and deck them out decorate them to the core and I thank the Lord for Nancy and the rest of the volunteers and team members and leaders coming through to minister to our children minister to the children in our communities and their parents and their family members as well all throughout the course of the week the theme was about lifting up and trusting God through the Jerusalem marketplace and not only that in the upper room we had Lori and her team leading out in ministering to our preschoolers. And we just want to thank the Lord for each and every one of you. From singing songs with our children, uh, from leading uh, people into the presence of God, through the puppet ministries, through the powerful drama ministries that God is instilling upon our church. I saw Janelle and I saw Diego, I saw Danny, I saw Ben and others coming through and really tugged all of our hearts closer to the presence of God. Also, as the children went out to, to the lobby, uh, to the fellowship hall, to the classrooms, the place transformed all the way back to 2,000 years ago when Jesus entered into to Jerusalem. And every single station was done so with so much excellence and so much heart that I just want to take a, mo a moment this morning to just recognize the individuals who took part from running the sound system all the way to running each station to those who caught the palm branches and to lay it on the courtyard. If, uh, if all of you are here this morning who took part in the, the, the Vacation Bible School, would you please stand with me? Amen, amen. Let's give them a round of applause. And I know that there are so much more who took part in the program, and we just want to thank each and every one of you. And thank you, Nancy, for leading the way as we continue to experience this here at our church and for our community. And we are looking forward to year 2023 when we have this once again. Lord willing, in heaven, <laughs> amen. But as we go into the word of God, let us pray again and again ask the Lord's presence to be with us. Heavenly Father, God, we want to take a moment again to acknowledge who you are. Thank you so much for your presence, and we continue to pray for the outpouring of your spirit as we go into the word of God. In Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. In a world full of wickedness, the Word of God, the Bible, time and time again, instructs us to find strength, not in us, but in God. 
And one of the things I recognize more than before is how we need to rely on God's strength in this time of uncertainty. We need to fully depend on the power of God in this evil time, and the Bible carefully instructs us how to be strong in God. Again, in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, the Word of God says, Finally, my brethren, my sisters, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. And then after this verse, Apostle Paul carefully lists out the step-by-step -step instruction as to how we can be strong in God and fight against the attacks of the enemy. So in the next verse, in verse 11, Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. And as we look a little further into this passage, it is said that God's armor consists of six items and we need all six because it is the Lord who has given them all to us as one set, as one piece. Again, we cannot afford to neglect one part of the armor without weakening the entire armor. And that is why in verse 13, Paul reiterates what he said in verse 11. So he says, therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So previously, we looked at the first three items of the armor of God, which is the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness and the sandals of the gospel of peace. And as the belt of truth is God's truth, as shown in Christ, and it is the basis of the Christian life, we learn that Christian life needs to be guarded by the breastplate of righteousness. And we need to have the sandals of the gospel of peace to stand firm against Satan's, uh, Satan's attacks and proclaim the gospel that Jesus, who is the Prince of Peace, is victorious over the powers of darkness. And today we are going to look at the shield of faith as it is written in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16. I found another image just like this. This is zoomed in. But when you zoom out, the shield is actually resting on a cross. Ephesians 6 verse 16 says, above all, taking the shield of faith which is, with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. This shield has the ability to quench how many fiery darts? All. All fiery darts of the wicked one. Again, like with other pieces of the armor, let's look at the imagery Paul was using here and how the shield was used in his day by the Roman soldiers. So there were two kinds of shields used by soldiers in Paul's day and two different Greek words to describe both of them. One was smaller and round and could be used by moving the arm to defend a certain parts of the body which was being threatened. Here's another picture. And here's another one, the artifact found by the archaeologist. And this is generally the type of shield we think about when we imagine a shield. You know, I think about the round shield. One of the things that comes to my mind when someone says shield, I think about Captain America. It was much, but there was also another kind of shield. It was much larger than the other. It was used differently. Rather than moving around to fend off attacks, it was planted in front of the soldiers. And sometimes, because of the nature of this particular shield, it was referred to as a door. If you're in a, if you're an enemy soldier and you want to get to a Roman soldier, you first had to get past 
the door, which is past the big shield, planted in front of all the soldiers. Here's the original piece. And we also see from Paul's choice of words in introducing this piece of armor that this is the type of shield, the door, like shield he had in mind. So the shield was the first line of defense. We think the soldiers are standing there as a first line of defense, but something was always in front of all the soldiers. And this was it, the door-like shield. And the shield not only protected the body of the soldier, but the other pieces of armor as well. It protected everything. But in combat, there was one thing that the shield of this sword was really good for. The shield were excellent for protecting the soldiers from the arrows and the spears from the enemy. And this is exactly what Paul is talking about in verse 16, where he tells us that this shield will protect us from all fiery darts. As you know, these fiery darts were one of the most advanced weapons of Paul's day. The archaeologist tells us that in Paul's day, some of the arrows and spears had tips made of some sort of combustible material, which was then lit on fire and shot and thrown into the enemy forces. They also made some with hollow tips, which were then packed with some kind of combustible, combustible material. And when it struck a soldier or a shield, it would burst and then splatter and splatter all over the place and then it will burn. This was before the days of gunpowder. So these weapons were pretty ingenious. So looking at the nature, the type, and the purpose of the shield, it is fairly clear that Paul intended the shield to be used for by Christians in spiritual warfare. Again, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Paul says, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all fiery darts of the wicked one, and to understand what the shield is, it helps to understand other elements in this verse. The wicked one is an obvious reference to Satan, and the weapons he describes as using here are typical of the type of weapons Satan prefers. You see, Satan, his tactics is covert in nature. You see, he is very cunning, and he will attack you when you are least expecting his attack. My friend, Satan loves covert operations. That's his go-to tactic of warfare. So much so that the Bible says that he is the prince of darkness, and he is able to masquerade even as an angel of light. Look it up yourself in 2 Corinthians 11, 14. Or 11, 14. And though his followers are wolves, I'm talking about false prophets and false Christ, they are also cunning to the point where they will appear in front of you in sheep's clothing. Jesus himself warned us of that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. So these fiery darts are the perfect weapon for Satan. He can shoot them far, from far off, and they come in quick and without any warning. And they cause great pain and great damage if they hit you. They can be sent one at a time or in a heavy hail of arrows. 
So with all of these things in mind, Paul reference, Paul's reference here to the fiery darts of the wicked one is a reference to the cunning and subtle and crafty ways the devil tries to attack and to tempt us. And you know, temptation often comes when and where least expect them. They come in quick without warning. And if we fall into temptation, the sin that results is often very painful and destructive, not only for ourselves, but people around us as well. And the temptation and the attack can come at one at a time or in a deadly hell all at once. And so the only way we can defend ourselves is by having ready the shield of faith at all times. What did I say? At all times. And guess what? This shield is available to us at all times. You know, just last night, I read one of the daily devotionals, which I am truly blessed with. And in yesterday's reading, it was on the very text we are on in this sermon series coming out of Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. And in this devotional, it says, These enemies are like the wind. We can't see them, but we can see the havoc they cause. Our only hope to win, asking God to equip us, yes, will always be his answer. We need to have the shield at all times. And, 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 and the thing is, when we ask God to equip us with this shield, the answer will always be yes. And I thank the Lord this morning that he comes through for us every single day. You see, if we are always equipped and protected by the shield of faith, none of Satan's fiery darts can get through. Whether he sends them at night or at day, whether whether one at a time or hundreds at a time, so whenever and wherever temptation comes or any enemy's attack may come, the shield of faith will deflect. And notice from verse 16 that more than just deflecting these darts, the shield can quench them. Now, it is said that these large shields that Roman soldiers would carry had a sheet out of, of animal leather on the surface of the shield. And before they go out into the battlefield, they would soak the shield with water for the sole purpose of quenching all the fiery darts that would come their way. So the shield of faith causes the flaming darts to lose their fire and their force. It will extinguish it all together. And it isn't just able to do this to some of the fiery darts, but verse 16 says the shield is able to quench all of fiery darts of the wicked one. And the shield of faith can protect us from each and every one of um, of the arrows. But just as with all the other pieces of armor, this protection is not automatic. Just as we have to put on the belt of truth and put on the breastplate of righteousness and put on the sandals of the gospel of peace, we have to take up the shield of faith. What did I say that we need to do? We need to take up the shield of faith. So here's a question. How can we as Christ followers, as Christians, take up the shield of faith? Well, first of all, in taking up the shield, we need to be reminded again that like all the other aspects of the armor, this piece also is from God's armory. And the idea that faith is a shield is everywhere in the Bible. 
For example, in Genesis chapter 15, we see Abram believing in God and his faith was credited to him as righteousness. And we are told in verse 1 of Genesis 15 that God will be Abram's shield. This is the reference. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Now take note, this is before his name was changed to Abraham. And it was God who said to him, Do not be afraid, Abraham. I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. God is here promising Abraham that if he places his faith in God, God will indeed protect him. And we find this same idea throughout the entire Old Testament. And this idea is found at least 20 times in just the book of Psalm alone. Over and over again, God in whom we place our faith and trust is described as our shield and our fortress. The one who protects us from the enemy. In Psalm 91.4, all of you are familiar with this chapter. We see that God is, God's faithfulness itself is described as a shield. It says, he shall cover you with his feathers, and under his wings you shall take refuge. His truth shall be your shield and buckler. And in Psalm 76, 1 and 3, we read that God breaks the arrows and the shield and the sword of our enemies. In Judah, God is known. His name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle and his dwelling place in Zion. There he broke the arrows of the bow, the shield, and the sword of battle. Ladies and gentlemen, when you take up that shield of faith, that shield has the power to break the arrows and the bows and the shield and the sword of the battle. It doesn't matter the kind of warfare tactic the enemy may use on you. It doesn't matter how much approaches you get from the enemy and attacks you time and time again with different armories. When you have that shield, the word of God says he will break the arrows of the bow, bow and the shield and the sword of battle. And then, over in Proverbs 3, Every word of God is pure. He is a shield to those who put their trust in him. That's why we sang the song this morning, "'Tis so sweet to trust in Jesus." Why? Because when you put your trust in Jesus, he will become your shield. So Paul, knowing this, he tells us in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, to take up the shield of faith. Take up the shield of faith. Because being a student of the Old Testament Bible, he knows and he believes God himself will protect us when we place our faith in him. Now, Please think about this for a moment. We just looked at the shield Paul had in mind in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 16, which was like a wall or a door behind which the soldier hid. The shield was considered to be the first line of defense, so for an enemy to get to the soldier, the enemy had to get past the shield first. So for an enemy to get to a soldier, they, can just, they can't just walk right up to you. They got to get through the door. They got to get through the wall. And guess what? The same is with our God. Amen. I thank the Lord for Brother Larry Grimaldi for reminding all of us, not just our children, but reminding all of us that our God is a big God.
You see, with God as our shield, you may ask yourself, what have we to fear? Can anything get past God? Of course not. Never. Therefore, as Christians, we have nothing to fear from Satan or wicked people or future events that would be catastrophic. My friends, God is on our side. Even when we walk through the valleys of the shadow of death, God is walking on our side. So in essence, please listen, in order to get through to the other pieces of armor, the enemy has to get past God first. Because we are putting our whole faith and trust not in ourselves, but in God who protects and defends us. Like the shepherd protecting the sheep in the pen by laying himself da down as the door so wolves cannot get to the sheep before they get to the shepherd. So just like the shepherd guarding the sheep as the door. Anything that gets to us has to go through God because he is our shield and he is our door. I mean, look at what Jesus said in John chapter 10, verses 7 to 11. Then Jesus said to them again, Most assuredly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but sheep did not hear them. As cunning and as conniving, as covert of the operation that enemy will pull on you by telling all kinds of lies. Do not listen because we are sheep of the Good Shepherd, amen? And we do not hear them. Jesus Christ says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and we will go in and out and find pasture. Isabel eloquently read for us this morning that God is here to save us. And we need to trust in him and we need to give praises unto his name every single day and moment of our lives. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. We're talking about the devil. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And here's how the Holy Spirit is connecting everything that we are experiencing during our worship service. When God blesses you, God blesses you abundantly, more than we can handle. My cup runneth over. So again, just like the shepherd guarding the sheep as the door, any sin that gets to us has to go through God because he is our shield and he is our door. He is our wall. But if that is the case, why do we still sin? And I want to end with this question. And if we sin, it is safe to say that the weapons of the enemy, the fiery darts of the wicked one, the temptation of Satan, do get through to us. So the question is, how? If God is our shield, how do they get past him? Well, the answer is found right here in verse 16 of Ephesians chapter 6, as Paul says, taking the shield of faith. The only way a fiery dart could get past the shield, the only way a temptation gets past the protective shield of God, the only way we get wounded spiritually and emotionally and mentally and even sometimes physically is because we have not taken up the shield of 
The only way a fiery dart gets past the shield is when we let down our guard. When there is a shield and we walk right into the enemy's camp without taking up the shield. That's how the enemy can get right to us. The only way a fiery dart gets past the shield is when we drop the shield. When you take up the shield, buckle that thing in. Do not ever let it go. You see, as long as the shield is up, nothing can get through. But when we drop it, when we don't pick it up, although we still have our other pieces of armor, we leave ourselves exposed to the darts. So that is why Paul encourages us to take up the shield of faith. My friends, as long as we are placing our faith in God, our shield is up. Let me say this one more time. As long as we are placing our trust and faith in God, our shield is up. But when we trust in ourselves and trust in others and in our own strength and our abilities, we are, in essence, dropping our shield and temptation will drop us where we stand. The Bible refers to keeping faith in God as living by faith. You see, the Christian life is not by sight. It is by faith. And we become Christians by placing faith in none other than Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. That's why we need to take up the shield of faith. Let us take up the shield. Take up the shield. And this is what it looks like. If all of us take up the shield as the Hemet Seventh-day Adventist Church, I have four images to show you. I said, let us take up the shield individually, but together as Hemet Seventh-day Adventist Church, because this is what it looks like when you take up the shield together. These are the special ops that would take up the shield. They bind together in total unison and total unity. And they are the ones who begin to travel and march forward into the enemy's camp. Here's another imagery. Here's another imagery. So, Hemet Church family, let us take up the shield of faith as we continue to advance forward. Let us take up the shield of faith as we continue to advance forward. And when I say let us, I'm not just talking to our elders. I'm not just talking to our leaders. I'm not just talking to the ministry leaders. I'm talking about each and every one of us with children combined. Let us take up the shield of faith as we advance forward in the battlefield for the Lord until Jesus comes. Amen? Amen? Amen.
Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a fortress of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of His Spirit, washed in His blood. This is my story, this is my song. Father God, we thank you so much for this time that you have given us to be in your presence, to worship you, and to glorify your name. May we go out there now as we take up the, the shield of faith and be assured that we'll be protected in your loving arms. We thank you and we bless your name. In Jesus Christ we pray, amen and amen. May God bless you all.